This week, we'll be talking about my Dragon's Dogma 2 thoughts, Final Fantasy 16 coming to more platforms, a ton of Xbox stuff, and much more. So sit back, relax, and let's chat around the bonfire. I am your host, Morgan, a.k.a. Bond, and this is a podcast about video game news, reviews, rumors, and speculation. Before we get started, please subscribe to the Bond Diesel YouTube channel, hit the like button, and leave a comment with your feedback or questions for the next episode. Or if you prefer, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review on Spotify or iTunes. Thank you to everyone who supports my content on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube with a special thanks to producer level supporter Hassan. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, please consider checking out those platforms at the link in the description of the show. Uh, this week's a, a weird one for me. Um, I was really busy this week uh, with work and all of that stuff leading into uh, what is a holiday weekend here in the States. Um, I haven't streamed in like a month. I, which means I haven't touched my Mass Effect playthrough in like a month. I have been playing quite a bit of Dragon's Dogma 2, even though my feelings on it are a bit mixed, which we'll get into later in the show. Um, it, it, a weird week, you know. Uh, I really did um, have some fun playing games this week, though, and I am excited to uh, to talk about some news this week. It's a pretty heavy Xbox uh, week if you've been paying attention. Um, I realize I've kind of accidentally become kind of an Xbox show, um, but I do want to cover PlayStation and Nintendo and obviously anything else that uh, kind of catches my eye as well. Getting into it, let's talk about some gaming news. First, we'll get into the Xbox stuff. According to Jez Corden on the Xbox Two podcast, Xbox is prototyping handhelds currently. Uh, so this was a story about, I believe he specified that they're in like the second round, quote unquote, of maybe, I, I hope that's the right quote, of prototypes um, and the kind of uh, devices they're considering for production. Um, the, the one thing I've seen a few people point out about this is to uh, acknowledge that this is, you know, if you want a handheld Xbox uh, product, this is probably a good sign. Um, but to also remember that these companies are prototyping and testing and kind of doing moonshots for stuff all the time, um, just because they're prototyping doesn't mean it's happening. I think it is happening. I think they're going to do something along that line, but it's no guarantee. I would also throw out there that if they're only prototyping at this point, it's probably not coming anytime soon. I think that lends to the idea of, of maybe that 2026 rumor that we heard, you know, a few weeks or months back at this point, but maybe longer. Um, this stuff takes a long time. It takes a long time to make a console. That's why, especially historically, when these consoles come out, their hardware is typically pretty far behind even the kind of medium spec for PC uh, when they come out. I will say the PS5 and the Series X um, both came out and um, still hold to be pretty decent, even I think today, honestly. I, I don't know if they're utilized very well. Maybe there's some choke points uh, within the hardware that keeps them from being exactly as competitive as their kind of rough equivalents uh, PC hardware-wise. Um, but this gen is actually, I think, pretty good, um, all things considered, right? But it takes a long time. They, they typically have to finalize a lot of these details about the consoles long before they come out. Uh, and that's likely the case here with this handheld. Uh, so if they're, you know, they could have the hardware that they want to use specified. And now they're trying to figure out the best way to package it. Um, where, you know, with a, with a, a console... Obviously, they put a lot of thought and stuff into the design and, and maybe the ergonomics to a point. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just going to sit on a shelf, right? Or maybe you won't even see it. It'll sit inside a closet or something. 
But with this handheld, that's going to be a whole different game. Uh, they, you know, the prototypes here aren't just going to be purely aesthetic. It's going to be feel and stuff as well. Uh, when we see all these handhelds that have been coming out over the last two or three years, um, I've never really heard too many people really complain about any of them. Um, just some with like weight, really the weight seems to be the bigger issue. Um, but yeah, so I assume they're going hard into that. Supposedly the handheld is being developed by the, um, the, the team that does the surface, which is that like really powerful, really nice kind of tablet computer that Microsoft, uh, is pretty well known for, um, lots of teachers and stuff use it. Uh, I believe it's, I think they have lots of uh, government contracts, uh, to sell those things. I believe it's also what the, uh, the NFL uses on their sidelines, uh, as Bill Belichick has, uh, shown that he's not a big fan of it multiple times, but I think, um, I think this is cool, uh, especially if it is the Surface team, because what that means, hopefully, is that the hardware team under Xbox specifically is all in, focused 100% on making one really good desktop box for the next uh, for the next generation or whatever you want to call it. Um, I you know, have really fallen into the side of uh, feeling like, man, I I don't. I think, I think the Series S was probably a mistake in hindsight, um, and and I really do believe if in this next gen uh, for Xbox, if instead of having two desktop consoles where one's more powerful and the other is less, even at a pretty good discount, if the idea for this next gen is to have this super machine that is a traditional desktop uh, console uh, or or, or you know, on their top, whatever, and then your lower tier console is a handheld that can be docked and still be played on a TV. Just that you know, it's you know, kind of like the Series S X comparison that we already have. That could be pretty cool and would probably be more realistic. I, it's hard for me to say that the S is a mistake. I just think that if it offered something the X didn't instead of only being negative other than being cheaper, that would be good. Um, I know that the S has sold more than the X, or at least that's what the uh, kind of accepted truth is. Um, but I suspect if Xbox would have gone the PlayStation 5 route and done a discless and a disc Series X, basically, uh, which they're just now coming out with a discless one, it looks like, which we'll talk about. And then did like, you know, the four ninety nine, three ninety nine thing. It probably would have been better. I don't know if it would have sold better. They probably would have overall sold fewer units. But I think they would have avoided so much of this drama when it comes to the like, oh, the Series S can't play these games and what happened like with Baldur's Gate 3 and things like that. Um, I say that fully acknowledging that I still, I believe the majority of that drama is just clickbait, but it doesn't matter what it is or isn't. It's there and it's happening and it still happens, you know, actively. And I think the conversation around this gen for Xbox, especially would have been better. Um, at the end of the day, it's more about the games, but I think that there is at least a, a small factor around these, uh, the conversations around you know, the, the issues with having this lower tier console. Um, I think it, I think it's hurt them in the long run. And I think that, uh, whatever they're doing next gen, if it is going to be a handheld instead of this lower tier console, I think the conversation is going to be a lot more positive, but I could be wrong. Speaking of the handheld, um, Phil Spencer uh, did an interview with the Polygon. Um, he talked a lot about, uh, what his like, he didn't acknowledge a handheld being developed, but he talked in like great detail about exactly what kind of handheld he wants. But he talked about a lot of other stuff as well, which has gotten a lot of people going uh, for better or worse. Uh, he talked about the layoffs they did after the acquisition went through for ABK, um, talking about how just due to a lack of growth uh, that they, they had to do that. That's obviously made a lot of people mad and does kind of sound like corporate BS, right? Um, to a point, um, what I think people don't always realize is that, you know, when he says this, when he says that they had to do those layoffs because they don't have enough growth, like that's technically true. The problem is, is that 
these publicly traded companies, especially these super giant ones who are beholden to their shareholders, um, they're being expected to have nearly unlimited growth. And that just isn't realistic, uh, especially in a market that's been growing as quickly revenue wise as Xbox and just gaming has been. It, it's not going to be unlimited growth. And so on one hand, you know, the, these companies are often being technically truthful when they say that they had to do layoffs because they didn't have enough growth. The problem is they're also being a little dishonest because the, the kind of growth they're being expected to have is just not realistic. Uh, I believe at one point Xbox was anticipating having like 100 million people on Game Pass. Uh, they're, they're probably never going to hit 50 million, and that's fine. The, supposedly, they have around 25 to 30 million people on, on Game Pass. That's amazing. That's a, about the expected sales of the Series S and X together. Now, obviously, I assume a lot of those are on um, PC or even the Xbox One or One X. I'm sure there's still people playing on those. Um, so I'm not, you know, I don't think that every single Series S or X has Game Pass, but it ha it's the equivalent in some capacity. And it, it's a shame that in today's market, you know, that can't just be appreciated. Like, wow, that's really good. It's the fact that it's not growing by a million users per month or whatever. Like, that it doesn't have, it's all about the growth when these conversations are happening instead of the sustainability sustainability. And of course I can't say that word, but, um, and I really hope, and I don't have any faith in this, that as these conversations move forward, that it becomes more about whether or not a company is efficient enough and sustainable in the way that they're doing their business rather than worrying about, uh, you know, how much, you know, if they're beating the next guy or if they had enough growth, one of the interesting things about the conversation between Sony and Nintendo and Xbox is that being third place, for lack of a better term, like Xbox is, doesn't have to be a bad thing if they're sustainable, if they're making enough profit, you know, if they're if they if they have enough of a margin to to be worthwhile, right? Like it's just an interesting thing. The, the conversation around this has been so interesting because, you know, you see people saying like, you know, the Xbox is failing and things like that. And we just recently found out that, you know, their games, uh, the games part of, of Microsoft is their highest grossing part of their company. Like, you know, for a company that has windows and all of the other things that they dabble in, that's a big deal. And for one of the biggest companies in the world, revenue wise, it's just interesting. I do think this layoff thing is, I, I think it deserves to be kind of, you know, made fun of the way it has been. I think the people doing it aren't always being completely honest about, you know, how truthful the statement is, but kind of the reasoning behind the statement sucks, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, he again reiterated here that the console market isn't growing and that they're having to try to figure out um, how to get more people into their ecosystem, knowing that it's going to be hard to pull people from other platforms. Um, when he talked a while back about how the last gen, the PS4, uh, Xbox One gen, was just such a hard one to lose for them and to, and to really get their butts kicked, it's, it's again, it's because of that digital library. The 360 and PS3, you could buy games on digital and download them, but that wasn't like the main way people did that, which meant that it was possible to convert people over to your system because, you know, you could sell your disc at GameStop and buy one for the other console if you decided to switch. Um, you would lose money, but you would at least make something back, right? Where nowadays... Everyone who had a PS4 for that whole gen or an Xbox One, probably the majority of their game library is stuck to that platform. And because there's not like cross buying of games, you can't just switch consoles and keep your library. So someone like me who probably has over 100 games on Xbox, switching to PlayStation would be really hard for me. Um, especially because their kind of Game Pass equivalent isn't great. Um, you know, like if I bought a PlayStation, it would probably be probably be mostly to just play their first party exclusives, right? Uh, because everything I have, like the division and division two is on my Xbox and, you know, literally thousands of hours invested there. 
uh, as well as a bunch of other games, especially older games that I bought that you can't get anymore. And so, you know, when they talk about this console market not growing, uh, you know, that also means it's going to be really hard for them to convert people from one platform to theirs. So that's why you see them testing the waters with selling their games on other platforms eventually after they've kind of been tapped out on their own platform. And why you see them inviting things like Steam to come to Xbox and to be able to play games through, uh, you know, through, through the box for Steam and, and even Epic and things like that. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing whether or not you, know, you believe them or not. Um, the younger generation, he talked a lot about and how it's very mobile focused. This has been a conversation for a while. Um, I still think that younger generation who may be very mobile based or tablet based or whatever, um, as they get older and maybe get some money, are more willing to get into the console market than maybe we give them credit for. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of those people going towards PC. I could be wrong. I don't have any stats to back that up, but it just seems kind of more logical to me, especially as you have kids who have grown up in a time where these consoles are kind of not the most cost effective thing on earth, at least not always. So um, I think that's an interesting take. And then him just talking straight up about how, you know, starting a brand new AAA IP at this point is a huge risk and it often isn't going to be worth it. And, and I think he's kind of getting at the idea that, you know, you see PlayStation mostly doing sequels and continuing existing franchises. You see, I think you see Xbox being a little more willing to experiment, but not really. Um, and that they're mostly doing the same thing. Even third party companies, you know, like the big the Ubisofts and the EAs and things like that. If you look at the big games they have in development, there's a few original names come in, but it's mostly existing IP that they're making continuing games for. And um, I, I don't think that's a, a bad point to make. So this interview has been kind of taken all kinds of ways. It seems like it's very um, console war based to wherever your loyalties lie is where you uh, what you believe or not. Um, and, and that's fine. You could say that about the next story. Um, Chris String, who's the head of game industry dot biz, um, claimed that at GDC, uh, multiple people he spoke to said that Xbox was becoming a less attractive platform to port games to and specified that um, at least one of these people was from one of the biggest publishers in Europe. Uh, and this comes on the heels of um, the stats coming out that uh, Xbox hardware took a 47% downturn in sales uh, in February, I believe it was. Um, th this was an interesting thing. So Chris String said this on a podcast uh, where he said a lot of things. Um, what, what I've seen people point out, and I think it's a good point, is that it is... I don't think Chris String is lying about this. I, I obviously have my personal preferences and loyalties, um, but I don't immediately immediately just want to be like, yeah, this guy's obviously a Sony shill. I don't think that's the case. I, I do think he's, I think this is clickbait to a point. I think that he and every other individual who is part of a website or gaming outlet that does news coverage probably saw a huge uptick in clicks a few weeks ago during the doom week for xbox when uh everyone thought that all the games were going to other platforms and that there was no more hardware coming and so i mean i think you've seen a, at least in my opinion a pretty obvious um kind of attempt uh, by all of these outlets and stuff to try to recapture that by talking about things like this um i don't say that though thinking that he just made this up what I would say is that it's likely he spoke to some people who said this stuff. The thing that probably isn't true is that, say, this large publisher, that he spoke to someone from that publisher who said something to this effect. That guy just might not like Xbox. Um, or he may just be saying, like, yeah, we've kind of been looking at that. But it doesn't mean they're changing anything. Um, one of the things that uh, it is... It, when, when you look at like, you know, PlayStation 5 has potentially doubled up its sales over Xbox. So you're looking at 60 million plus PlayStations, uh, you know, 30 million ish uh, Xboxes between the S and X. 
you you look at that and say, well, yeah, like obviously that makes Sony you know a must have for a platform that you put your game out on. What I don't think people recognize is that thirty million customers to put your games out to isn't nothing, right? It it, it may be a lot less than the other platforms, but it's certainly nothing to ignore. Um, you know, if they if they had only sold five or ten million consoles, then yeah, that's probably a problem, right? But but it's just it's weird. It, this was a weird um, statement he made because he also shortly after during the podcast said that Xbox is putting less focus on Game Pass, and like, well, I believe the thing about you know they, I believe he spoke to people who said the things. This one is kind of probably dumb. Um, I, I think what it's probably coming from are some stories that have come out since talking about how like indie devs are noticing that Xbox isn't so willing to like fully fund their games if they put them on Game Pass. Um, I mean, that's a lot more related to issues with things like interest rates and inflation and things like that, that we've been dealing with here in the States. Um, it, you know, it, I wouldn't say that Xbox is putting less emphasis on Game Pass just because they aren't handing out you know, free money to everyone anymore because it's not realistic for them to do so financially. Um, I suspect that Game Pass is still going to be the main focus of, of Xbox. And uh, w what I think is annoying about it is that, you know, him making this claim about, you know, these platforms not want or these publishers not wanting to put games out on the Xbox platform and then saying something like that, it just makes them feel a little less credible. So I, I think that there's probably truth behind the things that he's saying or he said in that interview or that podcast. I also suspect um, that doesn't mean anything really and that he's definitely trying to spice up some clicks, which is is fine. He's trying to help his business be sustainable. Good for him. Um, but I have to say that uh, I've basically become kind of borderline blind to almost any story from any of these outlets at this point. I, I just, I feel very, um, just very jaded, I guess that it's like hard to believe any of these stories that come out because they all just seem so opportunistic. Um, now in the long run, maybe they all come true and I, you know, eat my shoe. Right. But, um, we'll see. Uh, what, we, what we also saw this week was Bethesda celebrating Elder Scrolls' 30th anniversary, uh, and a big part of that was talking about the next game, that they are uh, in the middle of development on it. I would assume the bulk of their team has transitioned to that at this point since the release of Starfield. Um, I'm sure they still have a decent-sized team on Starfield working on DLC and bug fixing and all of that, um, but that's just the nature of these things. We'll see that in another story later. Um, but good for them. Um, I will say they have a little bit of an uphill battle, I think, um, since Starfield came out and what I think is a lot of hullabaloo around it. Uh, you've seen at least some loud voices, even if they're in the minority, really being like, well, I'm not even excited about the next Elder Scrolls game after Starfield. I, I think it's like kind of a dumb thing to say, because if you look at the things that Starfield has does be, like does the best of any game they've ever made um, when it comes to a lot of like environment like just a lot of things they've done well in that game even if people refuse to acknowledge it the, the problem with Starfield is it was also kind of an experiment for them and maybe they didn't maybe they weren't ready for that experiment I think that's a fair thing to say when it comes to limitations on their engine and things like that I think when you go when they go back to making something more familiar, something that isn't going to be, um, you know, trying to do the things that Starfield did with space flight and stuff. When, when you're talking about going back to a terrestrial game where, you know, everything's going to take place on land and you aren't gonna, going to be flying to other planets. I, I think you're going to see a lot of the things that they advance to Starfield and that they will advance more by the time this game comes out in like 10 years you'll see it pay off more. Um, I, I think, I think one of Starfield's biggest issues was that, you know, they, they did improve so much about their formula, uh, in some ways, uh, and just the graphics and things like that. But because so many of the things in Starfield were their first try at something, the, 
the improvements were covered up a lot by their first tries. Um, and that's a bummer because, um, you know, as someone who does like that game uh, more than it seems like a lot of people do, um, I, I think that's the things I noticed uh, and, and really latched on to and kind of maybe didn't care as much about the other stuff. But um, I think by the time it comes out, uh, people will be plenty happy with it. Um, even uh, if that is when like my kids in high school, <laughs> she's not in, she's not in actual school yet. Uh, the final Xbox story is we got leaked pictures of the digital Series X uh, and it's white. There's no price yet. Um, I think that's going to be one of the really big factors. Um, I, I think that uh, how much it is is going to be a really interesting um, thing to get from Xbox because I really hope they get aggressive with it. I'm afraid they aren't. Um, I've even seen a rumor that it's going to be $4.99. Um, you're not even seeing the, the Series X at $4.99 much right now. And doing a digital version with no Blu-ray drive for the same price, it it would bring on some unnecessary um, issues for them. Um, I know they can't go too cheap because they don't want to compete with their Series S, even though I think they should. Um, yeah, the Series S, I think, is $299. I mean, man, they, they, they really need to do three ninety nine at the absolute most. Uh, and even then, personally, because of the situation their hardware is in with the low sales and things like that, do the Series S 149, the one terabyte Series S 199, the digital Series X 299, and the Series X with the disc, three ninety nine, and just go forward like that because I've talked about this before. But surely clearing out that hardware at a loss or at a bad margin is better than it just sitting there. And it would at least boost God, like it would give them a little bit of something to be happy about when these stats come out. I'm sure they would sell pretty well in that case, especially alongside maybe some good games coming out this year. Uh, but man. I, I, if they really do that digital series X at four ninety nine, uh, you'll you'll be seeing some interesting reactions from me. But it looks great. I think it looks really nice. Uh, one part of it that looks really good too is the top, the grate that has like the uh, the green kind of uh, under layer on it. Uh, actually, looks pretty pretty nice. Um, I haven't even seen my Series X since I put it under my desk. Uh, I play it pretty often, uh, a couple times a week at least, uh, but I haven't seen it ever run. <laughs> it's always been under my desk. Uh, so for all I care, it could just be even more of a box. But uh, yeah, this digital Series X, it's a real moment for them to hopefully uh, maybe do something kind of exciting uh, with their hardware. Um, but I'm a little scared that they're going to do something stupid, but we'll see. Moving over to PlayStation, we have the Stellar Blade demo uh, has launched uh, as of today, the 29th. Um, the previews of the game uh, have been really positive, that it's a lot of fun, very solid action-packed game. Um, this was the game that I predicted was just going to be uh, maybe not really all that great, but was going to be a big, uh, really good demo for uh, booby and titty and butt physics. Um, but apparently it's actually pretty solid, which is great. You know, you don't... Um, you know, you don't want any game to be bad. Uh, one thing that does suck about this game, and it's not the game's fault at all, and I wouldn't say it's PlayStation's fault, but man, it would be great if some of these companies came out uh, and were a little more vocal about stuff. Um, but but Stellar Blade has become one of the main games behind all of the Gamergate crap and all these people trying to do the whole, like, you know, all, all the woke whatever, uh, the woke people are trying to make all women ugly in media and stuff. Um, the biggest example you'll see is people taking screenshots from the Fable trailer for Xbox and comparing it to the Stellar Blade. Um, what's, what's so funny about it is I've seen a bunch of these folks will post this tweet that came out a while back where it showed that the, the Stellar Blade protagonist that you play as, who they have made very voluptuous uh, and have applied a lot of geometry and physics to her rear end and her chest. Um, 
they uh, make they 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 retweet this tweet all the time. It's like this model is actually based on a real person, and it shows this lady. This I think she's a model or a singer or something. I think from Korea, um, getting scanned into the, this three D model scan of her, and this girl, she's a very pretty lady, um, but she is about one half the thickness of the stellar blade character and and what they're trying to say with this is like look they're putting real girls in the playstation games and then they're putting these fugly whatever ladies into xbox um and it's just not very true they've obviously made um this protagonist and stellar blade kind of a honeypot right um but if the game's really good then who cares it's kind of the bayonetta uh deal right um on the Xbox side, it also became a story too, and, and this just shows how desperate some of these weirdos are uh, to, to be weird about this stuff. Some website I've literally never heard of before was getting posted all over where they claimed that Xbox game developers were being uh, told not to make their characters overly attractive or something to that, uh, to that light. And it's just like, this is, if it's true, it's almost guaranteed to be something taken completely out of context. Uh, and of course, you know, they bring up again this character from the Fable uh, trailer, which is especially stupid because one, the person was modeled after, I think, one of the writers or developers on the game. And just, you know, the person kind of looks a little whatever, like, who cares? That trailer is like meant to be funny and kind of taken in jest. Uh, you know, they weren't trying to honey pot or sex pot this Fable protagonist and in fable in this next game i think they've already confirmed you make your own character you can make her as hot with some big old boobies and the biggest butt you've ever seen in your life i'm sure and they just decided not to do that for the trailer because honestly it's kind of cringe right uh but of course it goes off in this narrative and it's kind of what i said before that it seems like there's kind of a um just kind of a group think about anything xbox does at this point but whatever Back to Stellar Blade. I'm really, this is great. It seems like it's going to be a cool game. Um, I'm glad it is more than just a physics simulator for body parts. Um, and it, you know, sounds like it's going to be a great game. So uh, that should be really, really good for that developer. Uh, Sony also introduced a, a new community game help feature, which is really kind of strange. So it's a feature that I believe is going to automatically take clips that people make of their gameplay on playstation and uh from certain parts of games that it seems like other people are struggling with and they're going to be moderated so it's going to have to be manually approved but if this manual approver sees a clip that looks like it's basically like a uh, tutorial on how to beat like a hard part of a game that they can tell people are struggling with you'll be able to access this video to see how other people got past this part of a game now, what's weird about it is that YouTube exists. And so it's like kind of weird that they're even putting this feature in, um, especially when I think they had something kind of like this that they shut down like a few months after PlayStation came out. Um, Sony has a kind of a funny number of misses on their stuff. It's just their hits on things are so good. No one cares, which is fair. Um, this just seems like another one of those misses to me because these clips don't have any audio and I don't think there's any way for you to like add context. So I literally think it's just going to show you clips of the game you're playing from the part of the game you're playing and you're supposed to just like, like I'm sure it will help in some situations with like puzzles and things like that. But I'm kind of curious to how well this is going to work. Maybe it's going to be the best thing they've ever done. Um, I suspect it won't be and that it won't be on there a year from now, but they're trying new things. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the final story for PlayStation is that Chris Dring, again, on that same podcast that he talked about the Xbox stuff, uh, said that multiple developers at GDC didn't understand why the PS5 Pro exists uh, and doesn't seem um, all that excited about this console. Um, I think what this was supposed to be getting at was that like when the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X came out, they were, even though the hardware was still not amazing, they were pretty substantial uplifts. Um, and they seemed worth it to most developers to like put out a patch for those consoles um, to improve the, the playability of their games. Um, I know I had a 1X, I had a Scorpio edition. It was amazing. It was maybe my favorite console ever. But they, um, a lot of games, all of the games I played, put out patches 
to take advantage of that power boost. Um, it sounds like what the main issue is with this PS5 Pro is that if they want to use their PSSR or whatever, the DLSS equivalent, um, this uh, frame generation thing, the, the companies are going to have to manually put that into their games. There's going to be a lot of games that won't want to do that either because their teams have like moved on from that game if it came out a couple years ago or whatever. Um, I'm sure the first parties will probably do it, but you may not see full uh, implementation of that feature, which will make it kind of pointless because while it looks like there's about a 50% boost in GPU capability with the PS5 Pro, it looks like it's only about a 10% boost of CPU and if you've watched like Digital Foundry and things like that, you'll know or you'll hear them talk about how the main issue with these current consoles with most of the games they struggle with is CPU. I know the issue with Dragon's Dogma is CPU. Um, even on Xbox Series X, the reason that there's no 60 FPS mode for Starfield isn't really because the game can't it is so amazing. Obviously, it's, you know, I think it looks good graphically, but it's not like next gen, right? It's because of the way their engine handles CPU usage is the CPU just can't do it. So even, you know, this is a, not a great example because Starfield's not on PlayStation, but even if it was, maybe it will be one day, <laughs> um, it, it wouldn't run it any better. Even the PS5 Pro wouldn't because the GPU is not really the issue. It's, it's the CPU, uh, which is kind of interesting because... I, don't know, I think it's interesting. So it really seems like PlayStation with this PS5 Pro is really going to lean on that PSSR technology or software or whatever to to give you know all of these games these better graphics and uh, FPS. But it's unlikely that most games will take advantage of that because you already see games you know not being completely consistent with putting DLSS in, which is like one of the most popular uh, technologies that people want in the game, or even an FSR support in a good way, which the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series consoles both can use because they're AMD-based systems. And in theory, I believe even the Xbox was touted as having you know, its own chip to try to do some of this machine learning stuff. I don't think it's ever been fully taken advantage of, though. It probably wasn't viable, is my guess. And so... I kind of get it because at the end of the day, the usable power boost from what Digital Foundry and other people have said from this PS5 Pro is really only going to be that 10% boost to CPU. Um, while the GPU boost and, and this PSSR are cool ideas, they may just not be realistic um, for most uh, studios and publishers to even really take advantage of. Now, do I think the PS5, the PS6 is going to be doing the same stuff, but with the CPU boost, the GPU boost, are they going to push the PSSR really hard onto all the even third party publishers and stuff? For sure. No doubt in my mind at all. Um, but then what could be interesting is some of the rumors that people think, and I've thought of this as well, is if in the next gen of consoles, if Xbox teams up with NVIDIA or even Intel, who has XESS, these are all similar technologies, that it may actually make Xbox pretty attractive to developers and stuff because they won't just be developing that tech or putting that tech in their game for one platform. They'll be doing it for that platform and then all of the GPUs that also use that for PC players, which is going to be a better prospect for NVIDIA because... Intel just doesn't sell that many, many GPUs, at least not yet. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. I, I'm excited to see how this story kind of plays out. And um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be really interesting. The PS5 Pro is an interesting thing in general because even if it is amazing, even if it comes out and it's really, really good the way the PS4 Pro was, they don't really sell too many of these mid-gen refreshes. They're definitely for that more... Um, enthusiast crowd like myself people who stream and things like that um, because like if xbox put out a mid-gen refresh i'd probably get it even though i know it's probably kind of pointless um I, I use my xbox series x as basically my pc gaming computer the way you see like big streamers and content creators do it i do it on the budget right and so and i'm sure there's lots of other people who would do that with the ps5 pro but i just you know i suspect like the ps5 will probably still outsell the pro you know, month by month, but we'll see. Um, it's going to be really interesting when they finally announce this and finally give like actual specs. Um, because 
sometimes you almost wonder if these leaks are them kind of testing the market a little bit and seeing what people think, but we'll have to wait and see. 40 minutes into the show, we get to the Nintendo part, which will be very quick. Uh, they laid off a bunch of <laughs> quality assurance uh, folks, uh, supposedly because the Switch 2 or the next hardware from them got delayed, which also means that the games got delayed and won't be coming out for a bit longer. And the story is that the QA people just didn't have work, so they, they laid them off. So get unionized. QA folks, they're doing it all over the world now. Moving on to non-platform uh, specific, uh, for the most part, conversations. Uh, Yoshi P um, from Square Enix talked about how ports of Final Fantasy 16 um, are likely for other platforms after the PC one releases. Um, it, it's uh, there's a fun, there's been some funny stories lately of uh, yeah, the PC port from Final Fantasy 16 could come this year. And I'm like, yeah, I bet it comes a year and one day after the PlayStation version of it released because they there's been this big narrative of like, oh, yeah, they couldn't do the PC version and the PlayStation at the same time. They just they couldn't do it. They had to focus on PlayStation. Well, they focus on PlayStation because Sony's paying them an epic crap ton of money to put their games out there first before they put it out on PC or any other platforms. What was interesting about his uh, statement was that it implied that it's going to Play, uh, that Final Fantasy 16 is going to come to more platforms other than PC uh, afterwards. Um, that seems almost certain to be Xbox, um, potentially the next Switch as well, uh, and maybe other platforms. I have no idea what else he could be talking about. That would be a big deal because Final Fantasy very often misses Xbox. Uh, and it's not because you know Square Enix is a third-party studio, but when it comes to specific IPs and stuff like Final Fantasy... They might as well be like a unowned first party because Sony, I assume, pays very handsomely to make sure that those games either never make it to Xbox or don't for a very long time. We still don't have the Final Fantasy VII remake on Xbox, and there's no indication that's coming anytime soon. So um, definitely an interesting statement from Yoshi P, and uh, we'll have to see what comes of that. Uh, per uh, Kotaku, uh, GTA 6 is still being planned for early 2025, but production issues may lead to a delay to later in that year or even 2026. And then Bloomberg came out and said that uh, that reporting is false and that as far as they can tell from their sources, uh, that while Grand Theft Auto 6 is having some development issues, they're pretty normal and that their reaction to any kind of delay is being overblown and is unlikely. At least that's what I gathered from what I read. Uh, this was kind of an interesting one. I think everyone knows that Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to be such a moment in the gaming industry, whether you like the series or not, whether you like Rockstar or not, or Take Two or whatever, um, that, it, you know, we're just going to see these stories for the next year. Um, until this game actually comes out, you're going to see Freak Out because they're going to get clicks. Uh, like I said before, this is just like anything negative about Xbox, anything at all about Grand Theft Auto is, is going to be a moneymaker. So get used to these stories. Uh, another studio has been unembraced from Embracer. We have Gearbox has been sold to take two. Um, it, the conversation around this was interesting because a lot of people don't like take two, um, who is over, uh, rockstar and some other studios, um, because of some bad business practices and kind of some kind of shady stuff that they've been involved in with like the way their studios have to work and do overtime and crunch and all that. Um, but this is probably still a good thing for Gearbox. I believe um, a lot of people are at least tentatively excited about this because hopefully it means that maybe Gearbox will actually get to release some games. One of the notable things about the Embracer Group is that they bought a bunch of top tier IP and studios and have basically released nothing. And then they somehow seem confused about need, needing to sell off all their studios uh, or, or find money infusions from, you know, dictators. Uh, and, it, and it's like they, they just can't fathom that, you know, maybe you need to release games as a game publisher uh, if you don't want to have to shut everything down and sell it. So really hate Embracer. Really, really hate them. Um, mostly because they're the reason a Guardians of the Galaxy 2 game is never going to happen. Um, that just is always going to really just 
dig in at me. So F Embracer. Judas has been played by a select group of content creators, and there's a bunch of previews and kind of thoughts about the game out there right now. Uh, Judas is being made primarily by a studio uh, headed up by the creator of Bioshock. Uh, and if you see any of the gameplay from this game, that will make complete sense. Um, a lot of the previews have really tried to push that it is obviously very similar to Bioshock in a lot of noticeable ways, but that it's also not. They, uh, most of the previews I saw were mentioning like roguelite uh, mechanics and even like procedural uh, you know, tools and, and things being used uh, in the story and everything. Um, I'm going to be honest, everything I've seen about this and heard people talk about it, this, sounds, this game sounds completely unappealing to me. I like Bioshock. I actually really liked Infinite, which is, I think, kind of a controversial take. Um, I just don't love Bioshock. Uh, maybe if I revisited them, I would get a different appreciation. At the time the first game or two came out, I wasn't really looking for that experience necessarily. Uh, so maybe I'd be more into it now. But a lot of the elements they've talked about with this game really make it seem like it's going to be hard to land uh, what they're trying to do here. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, CD Projekt Red has acknowledged that most of their devs are working on the next Witcher right now, um, with some working on the next Cyberpunk and a small number on various other projects, including, I think, around 17 people still working on uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, this was uh, presented in some tweets they put out. One had a specific chart that showed, I think, around 400 devs are on the next Witcher game. Um, but a good chunk, a few, you know, a multiple dozen being on the next Cyberpunk game as well. Um, that shouldn't be too surprising. If you pay attention to all my content, you'll know that I cover um, Bioware quite a bit and talk a lot about the next Mass Effect. And I've seen people suggest that the next Mass Effect, uh, while the majority of their team is working on Dragon Age Dreadwolf, I've seen people suggest that there's only like five or six people working on Mass Effect. There's probably like 50 people working on Mass Effect in pre-production, um, but that's pre-production, right? Obviously, the you know they aren't going to really make progress uh, or do production on that game uh, until they get the rest of that team to to, to kind of shift over after Dreadwolf releases. So, um, you know, cool update. I'm a real weirdo with CDPR. I don't like Witcher Three. I've tried so many times, I just can't get into it. Um, I acknowledge the things about Cyberpunk that are good and that they did sign significantly improve over the last few years. But I still think that game is just a mile wide and an inch deep. I, I don't think it still to this day is the RPG even close to what they said it was going to be. I, I just think it's kind of a big facade. Um, so many of the things that they've like really bragged on themselves for improving, I think are still not very good. Like one thing people always talk about is like the police system and like they did add more things to it, but it's still real stupid and doesn't work very well. Um, my favorite thing with that point is I've, I've mentioned that cause I jumped in and played after the big police update. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, they do some new stuff, but they're still really stupid and they don't actually really pursue you for very long and stuff. Um, someone told me that that's actually narrative and that the police in night city just don't care. And so it's not, you know, the, it's not that the game is bad. They're just so good at depicting these cops from Night City. So I don't know. That's a, the fandom for Cyberpunk is pretty wild, but good for them. They like their game. That's okay. Uh, the final thing here is that Dragon's Dogma 2 uh, has been out for now a little over a week uh, with lots of thoughts. Um, they did release their first big patch, which did some pretty substantial things like I don't know, let you start a new game from scratch. Crazy, I know. It did reach almost a quarter million players on Steam, so probably pretty solid numbers on consoles as well. Um, my kind of thoughts at this point, I believe through the main story, I'm like 80% through um, from what I've read and some spoilers I've seen. I just... That game is so confusing to me because I really, really like parts of it. I'm probably going to play some tonight when I'm done recording this podcast. I want to finish it. I like exploring. I like the combat good enough. I've appreciated parts of the story. I've appreciated parts of like, there's like little affinity romance things that you can do. They're pretty underwhelming, but they're there kind of. My biggest issue with Dragon's Dogma 2 is that the entire game feels half done. Um, it seems like with the story without spoilers, 
you get to a point of the story where you think you're like, maybe like, I don't know, maybe a quarter of the way through, maybe halfway through even. And that's about to open up into this big, you know, this, the second half of the game only for me to find out that that is almost the end of the game. <laughs> you're, you're, you're basically done. Um, once you open up to this new thing, right. And then like, it does go back to like, like the environments are very pretty, but they're like kind of soulless. You can explore and find caves and monsters and, and do this stuff, but it's mostly the same monsters over and over again. And the caves, yeah, they aren't copy and pasted, but most of them don't have anything really that interesting. It's, it's a, it's a weird game where like, I'd give it like a solid, like seven out of 10. It's a good game. I think most people should play it. But if like even half of the game's like base mechanic, I'm not even talking like parts of the game are like super duper finished and extremely good and other parts aren't. I'm talking about like nothing in the game seems completely fleshed out. It's weird. And if even half of the things felt like fully fleshed out, this would be like a eight, nine out of 10, maybe a 10 out of 10. And, and maybe they'll, they'll do that with DLCs and updates and stuff. I, I just, I don't know. It's a weird, it's a weird game. So I, I still want to finish it. I want to do some more of the stuff I haven't done yet. I want to do the end game, which I won't spoil, but I've seen things about it. I'm curious if I like it or not. We'll see. Um, it's just a, it's a weird game. I, I think it's worth experiencing if you're interested and you have the money. Um, but it also will probably be, on sale before too long. So, um, I don't know. We'll see dragon's dogma Two, such a divisive game. And that is where I'm going to wrap up this episode. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the episode. Please consider supporting my content on Patreon or the other platforms I mentioned, uh, by checking out the link in the description of the show. That is all I have for this one. So until next time. <laughs>